Over the next few minutes, I'm hoping to pass on enough information to you guys, which will enable you to get off those dreaded fully automatic camera settings. Do you take pictures that are sometimes too bright and too dark, or sometimes too blurry? If that's you, then this video is for you. Hi guys, and welcome to this week's video. I'll be setting up a few demonstrations around the house. Um, the reason why is because we're in the middle of our lockdown with the coronavirus. So if you're watching this in six months time, that's the reason why I'm doing this video from home and not from the studio. But the good thing about that is when I set up these experiments from around the house, then you'll be able to do exactly the same thing and achieve exactly the same results. The first thing to point out is all cameras work in exactly the same way. You see, there's a science to photography and the science of photography applies to every camera, every make, model, brand, expensive or cheap, it's irrelevant. So if you're shooting with an entry-level digital SLR or if you're shooting with a pro camera or mirrorless or even the cameras on your smartphone, they all work in exactly the same way. So how do we ensure that we can take a perfectly exposed image every time? Moreover, how can we be creative with our cameras? So let's start off with the bare basics. Every camera has a digital sensor or film, of course, and their primary objective is to store light. The light that's stored, of course, then becomes our picture. And to ensure that the camera doesn't collect too much light, which would be an overexposed image, or not enough light, which would be an underexposed image, then every camera has at its disposable three controlling elements, your ISO, your aperture, and your shutter speed. ISO stands for International Standards Organization. You don't need to remember that because it's a bit confusing and it's not really that relevant. But what your ISO is, your ISO is your camera's sensitivity to light. They're based on numbers. The higher the number, the higher the sensitivity, the more reactive your camera's sensor is to light. The lower the numbers, the less reactive your camera's sensor is to light. As a general rule, if you shoot under low lighting conditions, the chances are your ISO numbers will be quite high. And the reason for that is because if there's not much light, then the camera's sensor needs to be much more reactive to what little light there is. So your camera's sensor in that instance is likely to be very reactive to light when you're shooting under low lighting conditions. There are times when that can change, of course, but let's keep things very simple to begin with. Under very bright conditions, so if you imagine a very sunny day, then as, an, as a general rule, your ISO will usually be set to about 100, its lowest point. So there's lots of natural light, therefore our ISO doesn't need to be very high at all. Low lighting conditions, a very high ISO number. Low lighting conditions, a very low ISO number. There is one slight thing to take into consideration, but I want you to take this with a pinch of salt because this is where I feel that most photographers offer bad advice. Under low lighting conditions, if you have to ramp up your ISO, then ramp up your ISO. The problem some people might point out or might point out that it's a problem when it really isn't, most ca all cameras will produce noise if you use a higher ISO. Noise is just another word for grain. In other words, if you shoot under low lighting conditions and you turn your ISO up to a really, really high number, then you will end up getting grainy pictures. But the one thing to remember is this. If you're shooting in a condition where the light dictates that your ISO should be high, then make sure it is. Because at the end of the day, it's much better having a grainy picture that you can clean up in post-production that's sharp or having a clean picture that's blurry. If you have a clean picture, but it's blurry, then there's only one place, then that lives, and that lives in the bin. So my advice to you is this, set your camera for the lighting conditions. Let the lighting conditions dictate to the camera and not the other way around. When we talk about the next two elements, there's two things I want to talk to you about, how they control light and how you can be creative using each one of them. 
Shutter speed is just the length of time the shutter stays open. Just imagine that like a blindfold. That's a long shutter speed. Without stating the obvious, that's a very fast shutter speed. In terms of controlling light, well, that's a very easy one to explain. Without stating the obvious, a longer shutter speed, the shutter stays open for longer, therefore offering much more time for the light to pass through the lens, through the shutter and onto the sensor. A faster shutter speed will allow less time. So a slower shutter speed will allow more time for the light to pass onto the sensor and a faster shutter speed will obviously allow the opposite. It'll allow a lot less time for the light to fall on to the sensor. Most cameras have a shutter speed range from 30 seconds, that's where the shutter stays open for 30 seconds, all the way up to 1 8,000th of a second. Your average camera, some might be slightly less, so instead of 8,000, it might be 4,000. And some cameras might actually extend for slightly longer than 30 seconds, they might actually go to a minute. And of course, some cameras have intervalometers and timers built into them, but we're not gonna cover that in this tutorial. So as a generalized rule, your shutter speed range will be everything from 30 seconds to 1 8,000th of a second. So 30 seconds is a very long shutter speed, well, actually 30 seconds, but 1 4,000th or 1 8,000th of a second is a very, very fast shutter speed. So let me give you this as an example with regards to shutter speeds controlling movement. If we start off from a set point of, let's say 125th of a second, now we deem 125th of a second to be an average shutter speed. And the reason why we assume that uh, 125th of a second is an average shutter speed is simply because it's the slowest shutter speed that most camera people can comfortably handhold. Anything slower than that, then just by simply pressing a button, could end up with a blurry picture. So 125th of a second, based on that, what can we capture at 125th of a second? Well, if you imagine, if we're at a garden party and somebody comes up and smiles into the camera, then they're just standing still, you're standing still, 125th of a second is perfectly fine. I'm going to snap the picture and I'm gonna capture a great image. But now the subject decides to run around the garden. Now, if the subject decides to run around the garden, 125th of a second is now too slow to capture the person running around the garden. What would actually happen is, whilst they're running around, and you can try this at home if you want, get your subject, one of the kids maybe, <laughs> get your subject to run around the garden, follow them at 125th of a second, and simply press the button. You're actually better off holding the camera still and just let the subject run. And as they're running, just simply click the button, and you'll see if the camera is still, everything in the garden will be perfectly sharp, except the subject that's moving will be blurred. Now, how blurred they are will depend on a couple of factors. One, how fast they're running. Two, how close they are to the camera lens. So that's a great experiment to try. But now if you increase your shutter speed to 1,000th of a second, which is roughly a fast enough shutter speed to capture a human being running, now do the same experiment. Get your subject running and running and running, keep the camera nice and still, and then take the picture and look at the difference. The human being, based again on the same elements, how fast they're running and how close they are to the camera lens, then they'll be frozen in the image. If they're slightly blurred, then just simply increase the shutter speed. That's how we gauge the shutter speed that we want. So for this example, we're using a regular fan that's revolving around about 2000 RPM. So as you can see with a fast moving subject at 30th of a second and then on to 60th of a second, you're not gonna see anything. It just looks like a complete blur. But then as the shutter speed starts to increase, you see more definition in the fans starting to appear. And that's an experiment you can try at home. Your aperture is just a hole that lets light through. Just imagine your aperture as a hole in a bucket of water. Your aperture lives in the lens, but it's controlled by the camera. So your aperture is a hole that lets light through, but it lives in the camera lens, but it's controlled by the camera itself. How does it control light? Well, it controls light, again, making reference back to the bucket of water. Your aperture goes big to small, 
big to small. And without stating the obvious, imagine a big hole in a bucket of water, water's gonna gush through it. Imagine a small hole in a bucket of water, water is going to trickle through it. So in terms of how your aperture controls light, well, that's pretty self-explanatory. Your apertures are measured as F numbers, F standing for focal. As you can see in this chart, the range in this particular lens is F 1.4 up to F 16. The only part when explaining how apertures work that confuses people is as you can see here, the smallest F number is represented by the biggest hole and the biggest F number is represented by the smallest hole. And that's as confusing as your aperture F numbers are going to be. So if you can get your head around the fact that the smallest number represents the biggest hole and the biggest number represents the smallest hole, you'll soon have this cracked. Your aperture controls your depth of field. Depth of field is simply an amount of image that's in focus. But there is an easy way to remember it. Small number represents a shallow depth of field and a big number represents a great depth of field. So small number, small depth of field, big number, big depth of field. And the numbers in between are just gradients that you'll just have to play around with your camera and see how they work for yourself. Small number, shallow depth of field, big number, great depth of field. So in this example, in the kitchen I'm using uh, four tins of beans equally placed away from each other and I'm going to allow the lens to focus on the first tin of beans and I won't move the focus point at all throughout these shots and I'm going to take a range of uh, a series of images from f 1.4 which is the widest my 50mm lens will allow me to go all the way up to f 22. If you look at the chart again, a good example of people who might opt for shallow or greater depth of field, well, your landscape photographer will tend to want everything from tippy toes to as far as the eye can see. So therefore, they will always want an aperture that's closed because they want a greater depth of field. Therefore, they'll opt for a larger F number, usually around about F8 or F11. That's enough to ensure, in most circumstances, that everything from tippy toes to as far as the eye can see to be in focus. Portrait photographers, on the other hand, usually opt for a shallow depth of field. So a shallow depth of field will be represented by something like 2.8 or F4. Again, there's lots of factors to take into consideration because the closer you get to the subject, for instance, the more pronounced or more defined the shallow depth of field is. It's also important to point out that the depth of field is always calculated from the focal point. So if I'm focusing on my hand from my angle here, then the depth of field, so in other words, that will be in focus there, out of focus towards the camera, then even more out of focus as it comes closer to the camera, and away from the camera, it's exactly the same, out of focus, then even more out of focus. So that's the important thing. When we take a picture, you end up with a, a plane of focus. So you don't focus from the inside of the lens out, you're simply focusing a distance away from where you're currently stood taking the picture. I hope that makes sense. Another thing to point out is your depth of field is always measured from the focal point. So whatever you focus on, then that will always be in focus, always. But depending on whether you want a shallow depth of field or a great depth of field, it will always be measured from whatever you focused on. Let me give you a couple of examples of how apertures are laid out in camera lenses. Uh, they might appear to be slightly different to you, but scientifically, of course, they work in the same way. So let's take this kit lens, for example. This is a standard 18 to 55 mil lens that the chances are you might well have on your camera right now. And this is called a variable aperture lens. And the reason why we call it a variable aperture lens, lens is because this particular one 
the aperture range will go from 3.5 up to f22. But it's the widest point we're going to look at. We can only achieve f3.5 when we zoom out. So on an 18 to 55 mil lens, the 18 mil lens is the widest. So if you zoom out, that's represented by these numbers on your lens. That's the 18 mil. If you zoom out at its widest, then that's when the aperture hole will be at its largest. So when you zoom out, because this is a variable aperture lens, zooming out will enable us to achieve a 3.5 aperture. But when you zoom in, in this instance is 55 mil, so we're going from 18 to 55 mil. Now that 3.5 mil is very difficult for manufacturers to achieve whilst zoomed in. So that 3.5 mil now will become 5.6. So if you look on the side of your lens and it says 3.5 stroke 5.6, that is why that's what the variable aperture actually means, 3.5 to 5.6. Now, if I look at this lens here, this is called a prime lens. It's a 100 mil macro lens. Now, this is a fixed focal lens. It means now I can't zoom in and I can't zoom out. It's stuck at 100 mil. But because it's stuck at 100 mil, it means now that manufacturers can make the aperture as a generalized uh, rule. It just means that the apertures can generally be much wider open. So this particular lens is as wide as 2.8. I have a 50 mil lens in my camera bag as well, and that goes as wide as 1.4. But it is important to note that irrespective of what camera make model brand that you have, like I say, photography is a science, so your aperture will work in exactly the same way in all of your different lenses. So now the important thing is, now that we know what aperture, shutter speed and ISO actually does and how we can utilize them to create our imagery, then let's move forward and concentrate on setting our camera so that we can take full advantage of that. And how we're going to do that is this. Well, first of all, let me just very briefly explain to you on here. We have a fully automatic, every camera has a fully automatic setting. Now, a fully automatic setting has its place in the world. It just means it's what I call a handbag mode. I just call it a handbag mode when I explain it to people. In other words, I need to grab a shot very quickly. So that'll come out of the bag, we'll switch it on, everything is in automatic, so the camera will just gauge how much light there is and make sure it tries its best to grab an image that's perfectly exposed but that's the level of control. You have no control over anything else. So if you grab your camera, depending on how much light there is in your scene, if you have moving subjects, the chances are they're gonna be blurred. Um, if there's not enough light, then the chances are the picture's going to be dark. You could end up with a shaky image. In other words, that really isn't the way to go. So moving forward, my advice to you would simply be this. Shoot in what we call the semi-automatic modes. So we know that shutter speed controls movement and we know that aperture controls depth of field. Let's just concentrate and practice on one of those disciplines to begin with. Let's start off with shutter speed. Well, if you switch your camera mode here to S or in Canon cameras is TV. So S stands for shutter, TV stands for time value. Set your camera to S or TV, that has now placed your camera into what's called a semi-automatic mode, it's shutter speed priority. A tip for you, just double check to make sure that your ISO is set to auto. It's so important that your ISO is set to auto. That way, this camera still becomes a point and shoot camera, so it doesn't have to play with your gray matter too much. This camera now is in a semi-automatic mode, but it's still point and shoot. The only difference is, if it's in shutter speed priority, the dial here, or here depends on what camera you've got, this dial here now will only adjust the shutter speed. Your ISO and your aperture will be taken care of automatically. It means now that in a point and shoot fashion, we can practice with our shutter speed. So in other words, go into the garden, shutter speed priority, 125th of a second, point and shoot at somebody smiling into the camera. 
you hold still, they hold still, take the picture, everything's perfectly fine. But now, use my example from earlier. Just simply set your camera shutter speed to a hundredth of a, a thousandth of a second, sorry. Set your camera to a thousandth of a second. Now ask the subject to run around the garden and simply to press the fire button and take the picture and look at the results. And like I said, if they're still slightly blurred in the image, increase the shutter speed or let's be creative and slow the shutter speed down and let's see how much we can blur them. Bit of a tip for you, if you slow your shutter speed down a lot, you can make the person running around in the garden disappear. That's one for you to practice, but make sure your camera's on a tripod and use the slowest shutter speed that you can based on the available light that you have at your disposal. Next, we know that aperture controls depth of field, so switch your camera to A or AV, aperture value or aperture priority. Your camera is now set at aperture priority. Double check, make sure your ISO is set to auto and the same principle applies. But now when we turn our dial, it's only adjusting our aperture. Your shutter speed now and your ISO will be uh, created for you automatically by the camera based on the available light. But now, turn it to the smallest number, focus on something as close to the camera as you can, and when you take a picture, you'll see now that the background will become blurred. And now increase the aperture, retake the same picture, and you'll see now that the background will become less blurred. And then play around. I'll give you a tip. If you want to really exaggerate the shallow depth of field, then make sure you focus on something very close to the camera. If you're trying to focus here and your camera won't take a picture, it's because you're trying to focus on something too close. The lens won't focus that close to the subject. So simply come back, come back until eventually the camera takes a picture. So that's it in a nutshell. The most important thing is to know how your ISO, your aperture and your shutter speed works. And my recommendation to you is like I said earlier, get it off auto, get it onto a semi-automatic mode and play around and have some fun. Remember, you can't break it. You cannot break it. But the most important thing is, is once you have a knowledge bank and you know what shutter speeds do and you know what apertures do, then make lots of mistakes, but don't dump your pictures. Don't delete your pictures. Have a look at the pictures on your screen that hasn't worked. There you'll see the pictures and you'll see all the information. In other words, the shutter speed, the aperture and the ISO that was taken. The difference is now, when you look at the pictures, if it's blurred, have a look at the what's called metadata and the data will probably tell you, ah, I shot that at 20th of a second. Oh, how silly of me, I'll never do that again. That's how you learn. So that's it. All that leaves me now is to say thank you for watching. If you've never come across this channel before, please make sure you sub to see future videos and give us a thumbs up as well. And don't forget to leave a comment below. I like to interact with people. Till the next time. Cheers.